Well, good morning, church. Uh, please take your seats. Well, thank you for the musicians for that. I mean, there's some... Uh, I think that the, the way that the praise and worship is adapted to the way that our church is going is quite amazing. Um, I'm really blessed, whether you are, by the simplicity, the, the, the genuine of heart. Not that it wasn't before, it's not what I'm saying, but it's, it's almost as though the church is going to, into a new phase, <clears throat> a new period of intimacy, and often that is led by the praise and worship. <clears throat> well, I wasn't expecting to be up here again, uh, not this soon, uh, but when Pastor Dave asked if I'd stand in, uh, I said yes. Now, the, the reason being is that he's our pastor. And as a member of this church, I want to do what I can to help him, to make his life full. And he needs rest. He needs time with his family. His children need time with him. So I was, I was pleased when he said, uh, would, you, would you do this morning? Now, as you all know, I, I'm, I'm no preacher. But, you see, is that when I walked away and thought, right, Dave has asked me to do this, I thought about this stage. And over the years that I've been, well, we've been listening to the preaching and the, and the teaching, the praise and worship, uh, the baptisms, the dedication, the, the, the children's uh, productions, the praise and worship. Uh, there's been four constant themes that I found that run through what takes place on this church, on this stage. Now, this stage is not holy. It's made out of six by two, with chipboard on the top, vinyl. There's a sound system, there's lights, and there's a pulpit or a lectern. None of these are holy, none of them. But what does happen is something takes place when the anointing comes on what is delivered in here. And what I've noticed, there are, there's been four elements that I've noticed from going from here. One, to give glory to God. Two, to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Three, to build up and strengthen the church, to mature and equip the followers of Jesus to do his will. Now, I've seen that happen. I've seen it take place as you have. But there's one other aspect which is I've had to consider. Do I love Jesus the man? See, I, I think it's we naturally love Jesus for what he's done. He's saved us, given us a new life. But the more I understand Jesus the man, the more I love him. See, Jesus the man is approachable. He knows the kind of things that all of us go through. No one else has done this. No one else. Jesus knows he, he, he walks with us. He talks with us. He laughs with us. He cries with us. And that's what makes me want to love him more. See, God, you know, he's, he's, he's got two natures, you know, one of the human man and God Almighty. And the more that I look at the man, the more I am grateful to God the Father for what he's done. So what I want to talk about this morning um, is that he understands humanity. Do you, do you ever get that when you, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking of Jesus, the magnificent creator, the wonder, the marvelous, majestic father, and yet there is Jesus, the man, that takes your hand, takes your arm, say, come on, Paul, let's go for a walk up mountain. Let's do whatever. I know that you're tired. I know you're maybe a bit lethargic, 
but let's go for a walk. Let's have a chat. And the humanity of Jesus allows that. So what I want to do, um, I'm going to give you lots of questions with not many answers. So, you know, you can make of that as you will. Uh, but what I want to look at is that some background to what I want to talk about. Jesus had moved from Nazareth, his hometown, to Capernaum, which is where Peter and a few of the other disciples lived. And Jesus moved in with Peter's family. And one evening, he said to the disciples, he said, let's get into the boat and go to the other side. So in they go, they enter the boat, halfway across the Sea of Galilee, the storm kicks up. And these are professional fishermen. They know this lake inside out. But what do they say? There's Jesus, human Jesus, <laughs> on a pillow in the back of the boat. And they're about to go down. Now, I can imagine this. There's the captain of the ship. Where, and he, he says, Jesus, aren't you concerned that we're about to die? Now, you can imagine the captain going up to Jesus. Come on. Now, wake up. Wake up. Don't, don't you see what's happening here? Pull your weight. You could get with so-and-so on the oar. Or you could help the guy pull, pull the sail down. See, what happened is that there was, des there was desperation in his voice. But what does Jesus do? This is in Mark 4, 39. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the disciples were absolutely terrified. And this is the bit. Who is this man? Who is this man? They asked each other, even the wind and the waves obey him. On the return journey, because this was Jesus' first ministry journey. He goes over to the other side of Galilee. He casts out the demons from the demoniac. They get back, back in the boat to return to Capernaum. Now, when they land at Capernaum, this is what I want to talk to you about. As he gets off the boat, he's met by a man called Jarius. Now, he was one of the leaders, the elders of the synagogue, a high up guy, right? So Jarius says, my daughter is ill. Will you come and lay hands on him? So what we have here, we have Jesus the human and Jesus the savior. So, if you want a theme for this morning's message, it's, um, it's called The Gift of Desperation. The Gift of Desperation. And you may sort of think, well, what good comes out of desperation? So, what we're going to look at now, if you, there's um, an image, I think, that comes up. Here we are. I'll move out of the way. This is Capernaum. Here is a third century synagogue built on the foundation of the synagogue that Jesus was in. Now, if you look at that, you can see the light stone of the synagogue, but down below it all is called basalt, is black stone. This is the actual foundation of the, t of the, the, the uh, synagogue that Jesus was in. This is the foundation, the black also is where this miracle took place. All right, you can see it. You can see it and you can go there. So what I'm going to do is read this text to you. This is Mark 5, 25 to 34. A woman who had an hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all but instead had become worse. After hearing about Jesus, she, she came up to the crowd behind him and touched the tassels of his cloak. For she had been saying to herself, if I just touch his garment, I will get well. And immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she had been healed of her disease. 
And immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power from him had gone out, turned around in, in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you and you say who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole story. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be cured of your disease. Now, her action set a precedence. If we look at Mark 6, 56, and wherever he came in villages, cities, countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplace and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. Now, that, what I've just read about uh, the the woman with the issue of blood are 199 words. 199 words. Now, do these 199 words express the full depth of what Jesus was about to do? We think not. We think not. Because this miracle is mentioned in three of the four Gospels. So there must be a priority here. There must be. There's more to it than meets the eye. Now, I'm saying to you is that the situation that this woman in is tragic. I think besides Job and all that he went through, there's not many people that went through what this woman went through. Now, do you understand that from 199 words? Maybe not. You know, it's something that you've read, whatever. But what I want to do is to unravel the background to some of this. Now, what I'm going to read is not the usual scripture that you would expect to get on a Sunday morning service, okay? It's a bit base. It's a bit base, but it's from the Word of God and what He wants to explain this miracle. This is in Leviticus 15, 25 to 27. If a woman has a flow of blood for many days that is unrelated to her menstrual period, or if the blood continues beyond the normal period, she is ceremonially unclean. As during her menstrual period, the woman will be unclean as long as the discharge continues. Any bed she lies on, any object she sits on, during that time will be unclean. Just as during the normal menstrual period. If any of you touch these things, you will be ceremonially unclean. You must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening. My gosh, this, this poor woman, this poor woman. Anything that she lies on, anything that she sits on is unclean. Whoever touches her bed is unclean. She can't sleep with her husband. Whether it is the bed or anything she is sitting on, when anyone else touches it, they are unclean. Her children can't sit on her lap. She cannot hug her own children because they're unclean. She has a stool maybe in the house that only she can sit on. Nobody else can use it. She can't cook because anything that she prepares will be unclean. So who cooks her meals? She's got to eat on her own. She can't even pre prepare the children's meals. So who is doing it? Maybe the older children. She is isolated from her neighbor. She's isolated from the, from the village. She can't go shopping. She can't touch anyone. Anything that she uses to cook, whether it be a clay pot, has to be smashed. What a life 
this world. We know what it was like when we were going through shutdown. All right? You imagine this multiplied 20 times for 12 years. Now, the person with such an infectious disease, now the point here is this wasn't a period. This wasn't a period. This was a hemorrhage. You've got to understand that any fluid that comes from the body, this is in, in, in um, Levitical law, any fluid that comes from the body is unclean. Anything. The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkept, cover the lower part of their face and cry out. It's a bit like us with our COVID masks on. And shout, unclean, unclean. All unclean people had to do that. There was actually a law that said they could stone an unclean person to death should they cause other people to become unclean intentionally. Unclean people's lifestyle were severely restricted in those days. They could not come into the temple because what they would do would contaminate the presence of God. Sin does that. Sin does that. They were completely cut off from the community. So when we go back to these 199 words, you can see there's more to it going on than we, than we, than we thought. The woman was condemned by religious law to believe that she was soiled and unworthy. Not only was she unclean, but anything she touched was unclean. This meant it was her responsibility not to contaminate others. I, I, I just think it's tragic, absolutely tragic, that a woman has got to put up with this. But here we go back to the fact that Jesus the human, Jesus the human understood. Now, she was under the law which is called correct. Now, correct means to be, to be cut off or to fell, to fell like a tree. Now, what this means, it's a form of punishment for sin. Because the flow of blood was unclean, it was considered sin. Now, what would happen with correct is that by Jewish tradition is that you wouldn't have lived out your whole life your soul would have been destroyed and separated from any future uh, life after. Sin does that. Sin does it. Now, also, and it says about that Jesus in, uh, this is in Numbers 15, 30, 38. <clears throat> I hope this isn't too deep for you, but you will see that this will all play out. Just be patient. It's going somewhere. <laughs> right. In Numbers 15, 38, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel. Now, was Jesus one of the children of Israel? Yes. All right. So, we've got to remember, this is relating to Jesus, the human. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels or zitzits. That's not two bumps on the side of your face, right? Um, make, make tassels or zitzits on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, everlasting. And to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners, and you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. I am the Lord your God. Now, could we just get the uh, image number two up? Okay. This is a zit zit. Now, what this done, it's to remind the wearer of God's commands, one on each corner. So, whether you are walking north, south, east, or west, 
you are acknowledging God's commands. You will see that the tassel itself is made up of eight strands that are folded in half and bound around with five knots. Now, those five knots represent the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Now, this zit zit, it represents the 613 laws that were given. So, I want you to imagine now that Jesus would have more than likely had this on his garment, okay? Because he honored his father's commandments and wanted to fulfill them. All right, so you're walking along the road and the tassels are moving about and, you know, you, you knock your hand on it and then it says that, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of bondage, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other God before me. Well, oh, that's, yeah, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your heart, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Just knocking that, all right? Keep my Sabbath holy, right? I'm walking along, I'm thinking that. So what happened is that their life is dependent on remembering the goodness of God. That's what it does, right? So you're remembering that all of the time. So what the zit zit is, is please bear with me. I'm so aware is that, you know, I'm passionate for Israel. I'm passionate for understanding the Old Testament, but it may not be your bag. But what I'm saying is, is that don't dis dispel scriptures that you don't understand, you know, dig deep, dig deep, and you will see as we go on what I'm trying to say. Now, the zit zit, I love that word, the zit zit is a symbol of life and death. Now, the commandments, or now, see, we, we are thinking in our Western society, this idea of law, a negative response to it, don't we? It's the law being told what to do, and that's what those Jews do. They try and come to God by works. No, they don't. No, what it is, is that these zitzits represent the commandments of a loving father that loves his kids. He loves his Jewish children. And he says to them, I've got these commandments that will protect you, that will look after you, take care of you when you're going through difficult times. It will watch over you when you are, you are dispersed all over the world. It will help you when you go through the Holocaust. It will help you when you are persecuted by the church. It will help you in all these things because I have chosen you and I want to take care of you. So these commands that I'm giving you will take care of you. Now, these commandments, many of them were for the Jews, not for us. It's, it's their commandments. So, when it says about that it's life and death, the commandments show that God gives life. Um, how can I explain this? If through consequences you violate these commandments, you enter into death, just like sin, isn't it? So really what the, the, the zit zit or the, the tassel is representing life and death and God showing that the law is there for you to keep, but also showing that you can't keep it. So, when also the last bit on this of uh, on the garment, on the garment, what they would do is that when somebody dies, they would wrap their garment or their prayer shawl or their talit around them, and they would cut off one zit zit. And what that would signify is that that man does no longer need to keep the law. He has been set free of keeping the law. It's what salvation does, 
isn't it? So what I now want to move on is that let's go back to the main text. All right, these, the, the, I, I've put some, some meat on the bones of, uh, of those 199 words. Hilary, can you get me some of that water? I'm, excuse me a minute. Okay, what's the, what's the theme? The gift of desperation. Can anything positive come out of the gift of desperation? Well, <laughs> we will see. Now, desperate means showing ex extreme urgency or intensity, especially because of great need or desire. Now, I think that this woman had all of that. 12 years. I mean, I wouldn't know what a period is, praise the Lord. But what you women have to go through, oh, anyway, but it's all an essential part of creation. It's all part of it. But you imagine that. I mean, I would have thought the loss of blood would make you quite tired. You know? Oh, I'm tired. I'm worn out. I've got no energy. My thinking's gone. It's like I got my brain is like there's a towel in there. Um, and she was like that for 12 years. 12 years. And um, see, what happened is that this brought this woman to desperation. It says here, and I'm going, to, I'm going to take it section by section. A woman who had an hemorrhage. This is really important because people say, oh, it's only a period. No, it's not. <laughs> this is deadly serious stuff. She could bleed to death because of this. For 12 years and endured much at the hands of many physicians. So in other words, in her own strength, she had done all she can to get well. Now, here's a question. Where did the money come from to pay for these physicians? Because she couldn't work unless she begged. Or did her husband say, well, I'll put some money down there. You have it. We don't know. But she tried all she could. She went to the doctors. You know, she would have gone to every consultant in our, t in our time, but instead became worse. Imagine that, laying out the money that you haven't got for something that doesn't work. I mean, you've got to go back to your husband and say, thanks for that money, but waste of time, just as bad. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched the tassel of his cloak. Now, what you've got to remember, there were a huge crowd following Jesus. So the moment she barges through... Everybody that she is touching becomes unclean. She is subject to correct. She is subject to correct, which means her soul will not benefit eternal life. That is desperation. That she is, I'm, not, I'm not putting up with this anymore. I don't care, I just, I'm, I'm gonna do anything I possibly can. So the desperation that she was in was also linked with fear. Because what are the consequences? We will see. For she had been saying to herself, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. That is faith desperation again. And now this is the wonderful part. It, it doesn't say after a few days or a few months or whatever. And immediately, immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body she was healed of that disease. Yes. Yes. You imagine that. You know, you're there 12 years. Whoosh. 
is gone. I met she, if she could do it, if she had the energy, she would be doing somersaults. And the people around her were thinking, what's going on? Because you remember, she hadn't told them that she was unclean. She was probably from another village because if she had been from Capernaum, they would have known that she was unclean. So she had to risk, dive into the crowd, cause contamination everywhere, because once they become unclean, none of those could go into the synagogue. Oh, what happens then? You can't fulfill the law. Now then, Jesus, Jesus the man and Jesus the Savior jump into action. Immediately, Jesus perceiving in himself that power from him had gone out. Immediately. The moment that woman touched those zit zits, something happened. We know that there, it, it's only wool, it's only knotted wool. There's nothing holy about it any more than this stage is holy. So what is happening, there is something quite supernatural that is taking place in the touching of these zit zits. Uh, what does he go on there? Who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked round to see the woman who had done this, but the woman fearing and trembling. Now, the reason she was fearing and trembling was that you've got to remember, Jesus was on his way with the leader of the synagogue to lay hands on his daughter. The leader of the synagogue had a real authority. By her touching Jesus, he would be unclean. He could no longer carry on with Jarius to see his daughter. So you could understand why she was then fearing and trembling. She was subject to correct. Aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him. So in other words, all the people that were watching were saying, what's going on here? Jesus, the human, steps in. See, the, the, the human Jesus is just so, so wonderful. The reason that, why I like him, he shows me how a human being should live on planet Earth without sin. Now, there is nobody else that can show me this. Only Jesus the man. What does it say? In, uh, in 2, 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might receive the righteousness of God through Christ. So what we have here is a human without sin. No one else. Only Jesus, the human, and he wants to be with me and you. He's wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. And then he, so it, then it goes on to say, I'm looking, oh my gosh. Anyway, you deliver what you deliver, deliver, deliver don't you? Um, but then she told him the whole truth. And then he says to her, Go in peace and be cured of your disease. I think that is just wonderful. Just wonderful. So what do we get here? Desperation released faith. Faith released power. She had to identify herself as the one who touched Jesus. She came trembling. See, Without desperation, this woman wouldn't have done this. She wouldn't. She would, she would have just hidden behind a tree somewhere, watched at a distance all these people flocking around Jesus. Her hair was matted. She looked a mess. She had no energy. She was sat there thinking, I want some of that. I want a touch from that man. Now, what you see here, we go back to the zit zits. 
when she touched those commandments, right, she would have been guilty of making Jesus unclean. But he was without sin. So her touching could not make him unclean. That's how it is with us. Our sin will not make him unclean. He chose to die to set us free of that. And that's the difference. That's the grace of God. So, here is an example. Here is an example. A driving test, right? You go and have a theory. You know, you get on your computer, you do the theory test. I mean, it was a little book when I did mine, but, you know, it was, you go and you take your theory test, and then you have a few lessons. And then when you've had 350 lessons, you, uh, you then take a test. And then when you pass your test, you get a little certificate that says you can drive which allows you to drive on the road. Now then, here is the question. When you learn to drive and you are a qualified driver, does the theory test or the driving lessons or the driving test become non-essential, right? No, they're still there because when you're driving along and you see a set of traffic lights, you know you've got to stop. How would you know that? Because you passed the theory test. So what is happening, the instruction or the law we are doing because we have learned how to do it and we're doing it naturally because we have qualified to be a qualified driver. It's a bit like when we enter the kingdom of God. Because that's what, the, that's what the zit zit is showing us. That the law is there, but we cannot, we cannot do it. We cannot do it. The law or the instruct. Well, that's what I was going to say beforehand. Don't get bogged down with the word law. Because it's a, it's a bad interpretation. Right? It means teaching. That's what it means. Teaching, instruction, or the way. And that's what it is. So the law means I'll slap you around the head, and if you don't get it right, you'll go to hell. There is a certain degree of truth in that, but God doesn't do it that way. Now, in so what we have got here then, if what Jesus was doing with the woman with the issue of blood, all right, he was fulfilling the law by allowing her to touch the hem of his garment. But the uncleanness was not touching him because he was God. So if we now look at Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, unto heaven and earth, earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. God is, what Jesus is saying, my Father's laws, teaching, instruction are for your good. So what they are doing, they are leading us to a place the, the law is leading us to a place where we say, I understand it, but I can't do it. It's beyond me. You know, uh, you know, it says, love your father and mother. Well, there were times in my young, you know, teenage life, I wasn't very good to my mum and dad. In fact, I beat my dad up when I was... Uh, when I was a, when well, I anyway, I was, and um, you know, I'm not proud of that by any means. Who would be? But the point was, is that I didn't give them the respect that the law told me I should, because what I was doing, I was looking at my father's external, judging him by it, and punishing him for what I saw. 
So what I was doing, I was looking at my father through my own distorted, rebellious, resentful eyes, not the God, God eyes that I became to know. So I've got 16 seconds left. Jesus is dealing with a woman shows he is the fulfillment of the law. So what we can see from these 199 words, there is so much more to it. So, so much more. And here is an example I want to give because, see, some of you may think, well, this is all a bit theological, isn't it? A bit deep. A bit deep, a bit boring. But no, it's not because it's the Word of God. If this helps you understand Jesus the man and fall in love with Jesus the man, I can assure you, you are going to love Jesus the Savior so much more because you know the whole characteristic of him. See, he's got two natures. He's fully man and fully God. I want to know someone like this. I want to know. I want to have a relationship. Here is, a, here is um, an example. And I'm... Certain parts of this are relevant to me, will be relevant to you. All right, then. So we say to ourselves, I'm struggling with my job. I'm struggling my, with my job. Please help me, Lord. Please help me. I'm struggling with the people I work with. Would you move them somewhere else? Put them in another department. Now, that would be great. All right. I'm fed up. I'm fed up doing the same job. Uh, give me another job, or even better, a new career. Oh, sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds good. But nothing much has changed. And then we hear, we hear a voice from inside us. Stop moaning and do something. Find another job. But I've been doing this job for 12 years. What else do I know? I, c I can't do anything else. And this is where the Holy Spirit jumps in. He knows that we are now coming from a place of questioning to a place of fear and desperation. We need to take action, just like the woman. She had to take action. So, the Holy Spirit says, write a CV but I don't know how to write a CV. Well, I will direct you to somebody that will help you to write a CV. Oh, I'm out of my depth here. I don't know what they're going to want. Am I going to be good enough? Are they going to say, well, I haven't got much of an education? Oh, you know, all that kind of negative things. And then he says, but what do I do with this CV that somebody's done for me? Well, give it to an agent and see whether they can find it. Well, that, that really is risky. I don't know anybody. Someone will help you. Three weeks later, you get a telephone call. Somebody says, come for an interview and get a job. Now, it's not going to be like that in every case. There are situations where people live in um, sexually abusive relationships. I mean, do you stay in that? Or do you say, look, I can't allow my children to be sexually abused by their stepfather I can't allow this, so I have got to make a decision that I don't want to make. I'm going to have to leave. I'm not going to have a home. I'm not going to have anywhere to go. I'll lose the car. I haven't got any money. What on earth is going to happen to me? Desperation. This is when we see the gift of desperation pushing us away from fear to a place of faith and action. Jesus can do what we can't do. As long as we think we can handle things in our own way, he will let us try. As long as, we, as long as what worked for us in the past is still working, we won't reach out for help. It's only when we run out of our own answers, we discover we will not succeed by our own strength or power, but by the Spirit, of the, by the Spirit says the Lord. He can do for us what we can't do for ourselves. How does this come about? Desperation. Now, 
when I was driving over this morning, the Lord said that there are going to be maybe two, three people. Yeah, it was three. Three people here that have got to make a real difficult decision. You are at a place of desperation. But what, what he says to you, he knows. He knows that you are out of your depth, just like the woman with the issue of blood. You're out of your depth. You don't want to make this decision. You don't want to do this, but you know you've got to. See, when I came to church, is that Matoma? Oh, sorry, I'm, I am going to, I am going to roll down now. Um, that's, thank you, Jenny. <laughs> um, you know that Hillary and myself lead trips to Israel, and uh, because of the situation, yet again it had to be postponed from next month to May next year. And I had to come to church last week, which I wanted to come to church, but I didn't. <laughs> because, you see, I had to tell these people they weren't going to Israel in six weeks' time. And I didn't want to do it. I did not want to do it. And I walked up the road, and David was out there. And he said, six weeks, Paul, and we're going. Oh, Jesus, I don't want to do this. See, I could have prayed... Oh, Lord, get rid of coronavirus. Open up Ben-Gurion Airport. Let everybody go in. Let all the hotels open up. Let all the restaurants open up. And everything be honky-dory. I could have prayed that. But that isn't the reality on the ground. So I had to come in here. I had to tell Jen. And I had to come and tell you. I had to tell Trish. And that was no fun. <laughs> Trish did not look happy, but it was something that had to be done. So, can we have the uh, last image? This really says it all for you, doesn't it? If you think of yourself being the woman with the issue of blood, there are things that you need to do, you want to do, you can't do. Call on Jesus the Savior. Look at Jesus the man. He's mighty. He is mighty. Walk in his footsteps. Sense him walking with you. Sense of him putting his arm around your back. Paul, I know things are tough. I know. I've been there. He walked on this earth where we were. So, for those of you that may be listening online, you may sort of think, well... That was, that was interesting. Uh, that was something that quite challenging. But I still don't know how to do it. What I'm going to say to you, there is a simple, and I call it a process. It sort of sounds a bit business-like, doesn't it? A process. But see, there is a simple way that Jesus hears the heart. And it's a simple prayer. And if you want to say it in your heart about asking Jesus the Savior to come and live in your heart and give you a new life, set you free just like the woman with the issue of blood, just like that. And it's a simple prayer. And I'm going to say this prayer. You can, you can say it in, in your heart uh, or make your own words that go along with that. But... Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize that my behavior, my thinking is sinful. I don't like it. I hate the way that I am. I don't want to be like this. But as an act of belief and faith in you, I'm asking you now to come into my heart and save me. To give me a new life. Be my Savior. Let me walk hand in hand with you. I know that you died to set me free of the power of the law or the teaching or the way, and I ask you now to save me. Amen.
So if any of you have said that or online, you want to know more about it, contact the church they will, where they will be in touch with you. They can send you a Bible if you should know, so need it. Um, but thank you for being so patient because it's not an easy thing when you're on a Sunday morning service talking about periods. Um, it's not the usual thing. Uh, but you can see how God is interested in every single aspect, every single aspect of your life. So, bless you. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you have any prayer requests, would like to share a testimony, or would like to give online, why not head over to our website, kings-church.org.uk. If you prayed the prayer of salvation today and would like us to contact you to help you with your next steps, please click on the Choose Jesus button of our website. Remember, you can stay connected at this time by staying in touch with your Connect and team leaders. If you are part of King's Church and are not yet connected, scroll down to our Connect Online section and we will be sure to get in touch. Thank you for tuning in. We look forward to meeting with you again very soon.